Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever, wherever you are. I'm really, truly excited today uh, because we have so many of you uh, to attend the launch of the book, The Transformers, from all over the world. My name is Tom Fister, and I'm today's host and the CMO for Data Migration International. I'm thrilled uh, to welcome the two uh, protagonists to our virtual book launch event, Andreas Grasser, uh, Andreas, the author of the book, The Transformers, and Liam Ryan, SAP's Managing Director of the SAP Labs in Ireland. Uh, today, Andreas and Liam will take you on a journey uh, through the digital world in times when economic conditions force companies to manage their bottom line, as we all know, reinvent or transform their business to become a true intelligent business. Uh, the Transformers book is Andreas' second book, in fact, he wrote for the business community. His primary intent is to encourage uh, the business communities around the world to think about data as the new oil of the 21st century. Jai Agassi, SAP's former president of SAP's technology group, summarizes it this way. The expansion of data and time horizons is the foundational bedrock for data transformers. New intelligent platforms extend data horizons into history to learn patterns that can predict the future. The transformer story fascinates me and hits the right mark. Before we kick off this web event, I'm privileged to introduce you first and foremost, Andreas. Welcome, Andreas, the author yeah, of the book. Andreas, a German-born former SAP senior executive who worked for more than 21 years in SAP, uh, and managed hundreds of highly complex transformational customer programs in North America, Latin, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Uh, in 2019, Andreas published his first best-selling book, uh, Run IT, Dominating Information Technology, laying out basically the details of the five pitfalls uh, of uh, software implementation. Now, today, Andreas specializes in digital uh, uh, business transformation services across many industries, working as an entrepreneur with his clients to invent and implement usage scenarios for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Andreas empowers today the business leaders to create their digital visions. Uh, Andreas lives in Wayne, just outside uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, uh, basically with his wife, Gudrun, who is, by the way, also on the call, and is the father of two daughters and one son. Andreas is an active cyclist and loves to play his pipe organ and uh, the piano. In addition, I would like also to introduce you to uh, Liam Ryan. Liam is the managing director of SAP's labs in Ireland. He joined SAP a long time ago in, in 1999 and has overseen the growth of SAP's operations in Ireland, totaling now to over 2,300 employees across 29 lines of business in Dublin and Galway. SAP Labs Ireland focuses on remote services delivery and among many other areas on BI research using smart insights for the SAP Analytics Cloud. Liam holds a bachelor's degree in electronic engineering from the DIT and Trinity College uh, in Dublin. He still lives in Dublin together with his family and is a keen golfer. Uh, before I turn over to our speakers, I would like to end my introduction with a quote uh, given by uh, Gert Oswald. Many of you know him, uh, currently the member of SAP supervisory board for this book launch. The Transformers describes not only SAP HANA's compelling predictive analytics capabilities, but also explains the required data transformation for the digitized enterprise explicitly. The simplification of companies' data architectures uh, will unleash innovative power never seen before. This book is a must read, and I agree with him on that, for all business leaders tasked with transformational programs. Uh, finally, please feel free uh, to send us during the session your questions via the chat box uh, and we will answer them uh, at the end of the interview. Now, please join me in welcoming Andreas and Levan to this session. Andreas, once again, congrats to this book and now over to Liam. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you. 
Many thanks, Tom, and many thanks for your introduction. And, and I would like to also congratulate Andreas. Andreas, we both go back a long way. You were my uh, first mentor at SAP uh, when I started in Ireland. And uh, I'm delighted that you have had the time even to uh, start writing uh, another book. So I guess, uh, how did the book come to life? Yeah, that was um, an interesting story. So I met uh, Tom in last November, I guess, was it? Uh, in down of, at his favorite coffee place, La Colombe. So, and I explained to him the concept, you know, so I wanted to write about a, a book about big data, big, you know, data transformation, business transformation. And I wanted to pitch the idea, okay, you know, he works for a company who does data transformation, you know, why not doing something together? So after some coffee, we, we got an agreement in principle. So it took still a little bit time to get everything worked out. But um, I can tell you, you know, once you have the book in your hands, finally printed, it's very rewarding. Right. And but but what's, I guess there must be a true motivation behind it. What kind of thing really struck you? I mean, my true motivation was really um, I wanted to help business leaders, you know, so obviously my favorite topic is digital business transformation. But I saw many people around me, you know, struggling to get their arms around digital, you know, what is it, you know, so from, from so my main motivation is really to, to give them a jump start, not only to, to, to get a better understanding what those three words mean, but also I want, I want to make them think about it, think about digital and more, even more doing something about it. I mean, we are now in, in the, these COVID-19 times, you know, the entire business world, uh, major, major industry parts, you know, they changed online and online is digital. So, so from that point, um, I want to reach out to business leaders and ask them, you know, if you're not already in the midst of a transformation, then start your digital business transformation now. Okay. I, I mean, digital business transformation, it's a, it's a really broad topic, a huge topic. And is there somebody specific? Who specifically is aimed at uh, with this book? I mean, I have the, the you know, I, I mentioned you already, I have the business leaders responsible who are involved or are involved in business transformation in mind. But I, I also want to reach out to IT leaders and of course, tomorrow leaders, you know, the MBA grads, for example, like my daughter just finished last Saturday her MBA study. So I included in this book, you know, more or less two, a little bit more product related chapters. But you know, the, 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 the main part of the book is really about concepts, methodologies. So I'm, I'm writing about these things. They are generic and easily applicable to everybody. Great, great. And I mean, uh, Tom mentioned it earlier, uh, data is the new oil. There's an awful lot of talk at this moment in time about data, data lakes. You refer in the book to a, a digital tsunami. I mean, how are we going to make sense of all, all of this, all this data? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, just think about your own devices, for example. I mean, you produce so much data in so many places, on, on social networks, on everywhere. I mean, email is maybe the, the, the smallest chunk of this all. Um, when you log on to your to the internet, I mean, your browser you know, produces or can produce a kind of a digital fingerprinting. So even not knowing your name, it can make you, you can be identifiable on the internet or take facial recognition, for example. I mean, you know, each photo that you post, you know, produces and contributes to the big data. So from that point, it's, it's um, uh, and very often I have to say, you have, if you post a photo, your so social network provider, you know, calculates a digital signature out of the photo. What makes you recognizable? Your photo makes, you know, is recognizable on the internet. And of course, this carries some risks. You know, you, your digital signature can expose your privacy. 
So therefore, I think protecting yourself is important. I mean, these days you're using and you're wearing face mask, you know, against, you know, protecting yourself against COVID-19. So, but do you, do you know that um, face masks also protect you against facial recognition? Yeah, a face masks cover too much of your face, you know? So from that point, the computers, they cannot calculate a, a digital signature. So at the end, so protecting your health and protecting your privacy is a, a nice side effect from wearing the face masks. Okay, and uh, I mean you mentioned uh, as well like data waves overrunning, and 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 you talk there about a few uh, examples in relation to people. What about businesses? How how does that apply to business? I mean, with business, they know there are all those big data around. That, but you know what I'm saying is they need to think about how to make this kind of big data work for them, so they can reach more customers. And as a side effect, you know, selling more stuff. You know, think about digital marketing. So the main question is really how to reach people who most probably will like and need your products or services. I mean, that's the, that's the core of digital marketing. But this only works if, and if, if your business becomes 100% digital and integrated. Okay, but I guess it sounds like you know you need to be a data scientist to get your head around all of all of this data. Is, is that something that you think? Do we all need to be data scientists? No, I don't think so. I mean, eventually you might need a data scientist if you are if you are not. But you know, at the end of the day, you need first to think about a usage scenario. You know, those scientists they cannot they cannot give you let's say advice how you know how can you how can you use this big data so so there is still a large gap to bridge i think from the theory of using big data to practical application to your own specific marketing campaign so the data scientists can help you at the end to tune algorithms but you know first and foremost the business idea and what you want to do this has to come from you yeah, yeah. And uh, Andreas, most of your working life has been in, in ERP. Um, I guess, when did you start to realize the need for digitizing how businesses run and, and what that impact would be? You, you, when we talk about digital and digitizing, what, what do you mean by that as well? Yeah, I mean, digital is nothing new. You know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, the ERP systems, think back to R2. I mean, the R2 era started 1981 ish so so at that time you know computers were there and and information was digitized so it's not new however if you think the challenges today people they are using and business they are using so many applications mainly in the cloud but these apps i would say they are not integrated they are not working together so they are more or less single pieces. So when I use the term digitizing, I mean basically that all business processes and transactions are completely integrated and controlled by computer systems. And I mean this really end to end. Okay. And uh, I mean, within the book, you mentioned the opportunity to, to innovate. Now, innovation itself means different things to different people. Um, any thoughts on how to manage or to drive or to, to foster innovation? Yeah, I mean, this is a very important topic because, you know, we, in these days, we are facing constant changes on consumer behaviors and customer needs. I mentioned already COVID-19 and everything goes online. I mean, if we want to stay in business, we have to react and we have to think about, you know, how to make things better and how to, to make my business applicable. So from that point, innovation is, I mean, the, the word innovation sounds pretty big, but innovation really starts very small, you know, how to, how to change immediately on, on customer needs. So 
in my life, I use design thinking um, as a as I mean, design thinking is my preferred uh, innovation methodology. It's easy to understand, and you can use it and execute it everywhere. It's easy to pull pull off. But you know what is behind this kind of methodology is really okay. You have a, a structured step approach, but at the end you spark new ideas. And this innovation is not always, okay, it's Nobel Prize uh, like level. I mean, innovation could be uh, on, the, on a very small level, you know, changing uh, things. So I think innovation is closer in my understanding, it's closer to, to change. And in, in our context, you know, innovation, how to use big data to advance and to transform business. So that's that's my point here. Okay, I, I mean, again, digital business transformation is such a large thing. Any other success ingredients, uh, innovation we just spoken about uh, around uh, transformation? Yeah, I mean, very close to innovation. I think it's what I call thought leadership. I mean, the business leaders they need to know, and I guess I come back um, a little bit later to this topic. But thought leadership knowing what you want to do is very important. Secondly, I think the communication is very important. I mean, it, it's not enough you have your vision in your head. I mean, you need to be able to share your ideas, to explain it to your people, to, to explain it simple and easy and, and encourage them so they follow you. And then, of course, uh, the third area is the vision and execution. So this is, um, I think, success ingredients for digital business transformation is always to to also to predict the future or foresee the future or foresee how business will turn on, you know, the, the possibilities how business can turn and to make it happen. So this is my, my um, so those are the three success ingredients, I think, in 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 addition and above uh, innovation. Great, great. Um, I mean, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the, it's the new oil, data is the new oil, and, and um, uh, but you go a little bit further and talk about the crown jewels and, and the value of data. Why, why the crown jewels and, and the value? Yeah, I mean, the data enterprises, um, you know, they, the, the enterprises, they have data about customers, products, intellectual properties and i think in in many cases i mean think about your customer data those are the most valuable items basically you have uh, not first you know you have it in you know. so i think we should really um, treat them like jewelry and th therefore i came with this picture okay my data on tools that need protection so of course, the data is not physical, but I need a safe place for the data. And so, so usually it's a, a secure data store. And in my mind, it's not somewhere in the cloud. Okay. And an awful lot of companies over the years would have built up a lot of information, possibly on paper, possibly uh, um, digitized. But um, what happens to those companies who still have non-digitized we'll call them data sheets yeah if they have non-digital if they have data sheets i mean and i say digitize now i mean this is i mean without um i mean if you think ahead i mean without digital i mean you won't survive in the long run i would say in the long run i mean five to ten years from now so this is the first step is you would you would of course you know scan all those paper architectural designs or whatever it is in into pdf format and then save and organize the pdfs in your data store and if you're really going highly sophisticated in the digitization then i think use uh, you know software that does pattern recognition so it's not only that you do you just scan um, an architectural design, but you really put it, you, you scan it in a way that it's recognized like the, the facial rec recognition uh, algorithms, what we discussed earlier. So if you have m millions of plans and designs to digitize, I think it makes sense to use such tools to help you uh, digitize, digitize now. But 
there is no way around. You have to do it now. Yeah, yeah. And I guess um, you know, back to our crown jewels. If, if I think for me, the most famous crown jewels are the ones over in the Tower of London, and they are very well protected. Um, how about uh, the crown jewels in in order? How, they also need to be protected. Any any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, think about um, you know a boiler manufacturer, for example. I mean, this is uh, maybe a business already uh, in business for more than 40 years, but there are still might be boilers out there still working and need maintenance and so on. But those maintenance guides and architecture plans for all those boiler models, um, you know, you need to have accessible. So you have to have access to design plans. Um, that's crucial, particular if it's in if it's becoming emergency situations. So those are for, for this specific company, you know, those old um, plans and guidelines and, 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 and designs, they're really the, the crown tools for this company. But think about your, yourself, I mean, your own privacy data. You know, we, we, we discussed before, you know, con, uh, customer data, privacy data, I mean, um, I consider these particular privacy data. I co consider this as well as, uh, as as crown jewels. So therefore, I think um, you know they are protected in some countries even by law. So we have the the GDPR, so the General Data Protection Regulations in the EU, and we have similar um, laws here in in the United States in California with the California Consumer Privacy Privacy Act. But you know, at the end of the day, laws is not everything. I mean, at the end of the day, data protection of your uh, um, crown jewels requires a kind of a human firewall. So most of the time, if you read the statistics, most of the time hackers you know gain access to systems or obtain logon data. You know, this happens through social engineering. So from that point, um, despite all technology tools and efforts to protecting data, the weakest link is the weakest link in the chain is the other human beings, and therefore you we need also to have you know training and and awareness um, sessions you know for 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 colleagues for for everybody uh, working in in a certain company to help protect data. Yeah, I agree, I mean, wholeheartedly. It, it, and, it, and it's something that we really try and, and emphasize in SAP as well. So I, I guess we've, uh, we've lots of data and, and the amount is increasing year on year, you know, old data as well. Um, like how long do we need to keep it? How long is this old data piece of string, um, so to speak? That's a good question. I mean, I say old data is not like red wine. What is what means the older the better, okay? But uh, on the other side, all data needs to be preserved because you know, business leaders today they don't know exactly if and when and how this so-called old data or historical data is being used uh, or needed at one point in the future. So think about re refineries of big oil and gas uh, oil companies. I mean, a refinery, you know, it runs at least for 50 years, and they consist, I don't know, of millions of parts. Uh, the refinery uh, that the, the parts need to have maintenance tracks and locks and everything. So the entire maintenance data must be tracked and locked. So 50 years is is a long time if you if you think back your know, your own age, so to speak. But you know, for those kind of big items um, like a refinery, it's it's just you know to make break even, you know, after such a long time. So from that point, um, I would say uh, 30 to 50 years is sometimes even needed in some businesses. 
Right, right. Um, experience management is a, experience management is a, is a category that that uh, SAP is investing very, very heavily in, and, and sees a huge future for as well. And it's all about understanding our our, uh, our customers and employees are feeling. And SAP talks about combining X and and O data by collecting experience data at, at every meaningful touch point. But you introduce in your book the concept of H data, so combining X and O and H data. Maybe you might expand on that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So I expanded the model by an, by the historical component. By H data means historical data, means old data. So I call it the XOH model. And it combines really X data, what is experience data. And I explain this in a, in a second. Uh, o data, what is operational data. And H data, what is historical data. So in my view, all the three data layers, they are needed in within a digital business. So to explain it a little bit, I mean, all data, the so operational data, we, we know long for uh, for a long time out of the ERP world. So this is, you know, sales orders, financial data, all that stuff. Um, X data, X data, so this is more um, experience data. It describes likes or usability, or it describes sentiments, you know, somebody has preferences, somebody says, I'm happy about whatever. You know, this is um, more or less the feelings, uh, the feeling component in the model. And then you have the age data, the historical data. So on, on, the, on the basis of the old data, we can develop and calculate predictions into the future, you know, to develop uh, future patterns, uh, future uh, predict future outcomes. So all the okay. three components need need to be together. So X, O, and H. And H. And any examples of companies, especially using X data? Yeah, I mean, I still have a, a, a favorite business example. So what is Burberry? So they they use it. They consume more or less real time data to create unique, unique experiences for, for their customers. So they use, for example, um, buying re records from the past of their customers, what is in our model, the age data. So they're combining it with actual data, um, like, you know, product availability, logistical information, shipment information, and so on. What is the old data? And then they create, let's say, an experience that um, um, helps, you know, to entice customers. For example, somebody uh, shopper walks into Burberry. Uh, we capture the idea through RFID, you know, on the back end in real time. You know, the computer model would create and calculate, um, let's say, um, preferences in fashions and at the same time would then, while the shopper is still in, 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 in the store, would bring up those kind of uh, fashion examples on, on the screens. Mm -hmm. So this would help, you know, to, to, to convince customers, okay, um, okay, I, even the customer even didn't know he, he likes it, but based on, on history, you know, you can, you know, com, you know, condense and, and, and identify patterns what a customer might might want to buy. So from that point, I think it's a, a, a nice case combining in real time, you know, specific data extracted from the big data pools. Okay, and I mean, old data has been around for a long time. The the, the operational data, and, and I guess that that then feeds into into the H data, data. They've been around for quite a long time. What do you believe was the real breakthrough that enabled real time processing of of data of old data? Yeah, I think the um, the real breakthrough was really the invention of the in memory database. Um, so I think this played an, an, an a very important role in this entire. Um, schema in, in particular for, for the business world. So operational data in real time. And I think it was really made by Hasso Plattner's vision. And he started 
It was around maybe 2006 with his Census C database prototype at the HPI. So he has a Platner Institute where he he um, created an, a column store database design that was capable of reading millions of data points in fractions of seconds. So all this entire huge amount of data basically available on your fingertips. So I think Hasso did really, um, um, you know, he path he he path uh, he he created the path for business to use this big data for their own uh, purposes. Okay, and uh, I mean it's great, um, you know, the way it was developed. But do we need to be a data analyst then to make sense of all that data and and and, and how to make sense of it? No, I think uh, Liam. I think the yeah, my plain simple answer is no. Um, you don't have to be a data analyst, but you, as I said earlier already, you need to have a, a business vision about what to do with all this data. You know, for example, we have vast amounts of data that can help um, predicting future outcomes of events. So define event for me, you know, so this is, it's very customer specific. Or I talked about identification of patterns, you know, so define what is a pattern for me. So what are you looking for um, to get out of this big data pool? So from, from that point, I think my approach is always business value first. You, know, you need to have an, an idea of, um, you know, what you want to do uh, with the data from a business perspective, and then you might need to work with a data scientist at the end of the day uh, who helps you to develop predictive algorithms to, to do what you want to do. So I think um, you don't have to be a data analyst or a data scientist. At the end of the day, um, you need to have the business vision uh, what you want to do with the data. Okay, and I don't mean to pick on poor data scientists. We have, a, we have a, lots of really good data scientists in, in, in SAP as well. Yeah. Um, but a lot of these capabilities that you talked about, um, are they built into, into HANA already? I mean, many of those uh, capabilities are um, already built in into HANA. So the answer is yes. So HANA provides really a broad set of analytical capabilities, particular for predictive analytics, text analytics, and streaming. So this is, but let me let me first make an example, you know, from from the area of Internet of Things from, from IoT. So Tren Italia is a, is the Italian railway uh, um, a company, and they introduced they they are using since a few years already you know predictive maintenance so all moving parts of their trains they got sensors and sensors they measure conditions like heat at the brakes or closing time of the door temperatures of cooling systems you know energy consumption that you know those kind of things they they might point to to um, to potential breaks in the future or, or not. So all sensors, they send uh, data points continuously to the central data storage, what was or uh, is uh, a HANA system. So algorithms calculate their measurements and they always calculate deviations from the expected benchmark. So any deviation could indicate a potential break in in you know coming coming down the road. So from that point, depending on the, the deviation, they define a severity if a certain part has to be exchanged at the next stop of the train or at the end of the day, or at, at or it can wait until the next scheduled maintenance window. So predictive maintenance. In this case, it's really repairing uh, before it breaks. So, in fact, uh, this, con this, this concept of preventive maintenance got already into production at SAP more than 30 years ago. So, Dr. Hommel named it early watch service. Remember, Liam, 
this early watch thing brought us together in Dublin in 1998. That's right. That's right. I remember it well, absolutely. Um, and and I guess you know sentiment analysis, X data, sometimes difficult to get your head around. Um, maybe talk a little bit about sentiment analysis and, and the impact. Yes, I think um, yeah, you're right. So sentiment analysis is another predictive scenario. It's also supported by SP HANA, but it it's more or less the ongoing filtering of data points or data streams from from Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, in order to determine notions, emotions about an event or a product. We take, for example, uh, a go live situation that uh, of a customer that might impact all or most of its customers. Like, an, you know, a bank brings out a, a new online application, so they want to observe comments and chats on social media about customer feelings and perceptions of of the hmm. of of the um, of, of of the project or of the progress so some years ago you know when i was still involved in in a, in a bank um, uh, go live we had a full team of people you know they did nothing else than you know manually you know, logging on to to those kind of to to chat rooms and to social media, to Twitter, Facebook, to identify if if there are some glitches. So today, you could just stream automatically into Hana and get your your information at the you know immediately. Great. I mean, you know, we've we've had many experiences uh, ourselves um, in in terms of go live situations and, and you mentioned go live as well earlier and, and it, I guess it leads to a very wide and, and complex topic uh, all around the implementation and the implementation strategies and you know we have X, O and, and H data and of course we need to do something with it but I guess what's the most needed capability um, that business leaders need to have to bring to the table to be able to tackle these challenges? Yeah, so I think it's strategic thinking so I, I guess I, I mentioned already in several occasions. So it's it's really strategic thinking and think ahead. So I learned much from Sun Tzu, you know, who wrote a, a book, uh, a booklet, The Art of War. Um, it's more than 2,500 years ago. But in a nutshell, uh, while he was, of course, uh, um, a war officer, but he always had to think strategically, and he his main strategic thinking idea was, you know, he always wanted to outsmart his opponents. So he, he says, basically, in a nutshell, truly wins who does not fight. So what does mean words? It's winning without fighting. Okay, fight, fighting talk, and and I get something from two thousand five years, uh, two thousand five hundred years ago. You know, is, is it really relevant? I guess what article or, or what element of that then really stands out for you? Yeah, he, his booklet uh, um, includes, I guess, thirteen articles. But the the most important one for me was Article One, what is about planning. Uh, so. Sun Tzu, he writes about factors like weather, time, terrain, leadership, discipline. Um, so as such, he he really had a, a, a complex model of different factors in mind. So what we can learn uh, out of him uh, from 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 this old 2,500 year old uh, thinking. I mean, think about terrain. I mean, terrain in, in his world was really, you know, out there and fighting, you know, using landscapes and whatsoever. So terrain in our digital world is still there, but of course it changed, you know. So, uh, but what I think is most important um, um, to this uh, very day is uh, two things. What is discipline and leadership? So this means um, think about um, business leaders. They they uh, try to apply technology to business. So if you 
translate more or less his Sun Tzu's thinking uh, into today's world. It means you know digital means technology. Therefore, I think business leaders must understand the core principles of technology, so they cannot just uh, give it away or delegate it to somebody. So they need to understand the core principles of those things themselves. Okay. And I guess to support your theory um, of the need for strategic thinking, um, you developed uh, what, what you call a strategic compass. Maybe tell us a, a little bit about the, the strategic compass. Yeah, so I try to put more or less, uh, you know, um, very interesting ideas uh, Sun Tzu has into, into more um, an, an easy picture. So I found a compass would might help here to better understand. So on the north side, you know, we have the leadership. So I talked about leadership. It's very important. Um, it's for me, it's the main key. So a leader, they always know precisely what his or her strengths and weaknesses are. So on the compass on the South Pole, uh, it's it's counterbalanced with execution. So you have to do uh, what you say. You have to walk the talk. You have to be able to set you know, uh, things in motion. On on the one hand side to to the right, you have then the vision, what I talked about already several times. So you have to um, the capability to think ahead and to identify more or less future outcomes. And then of course the tactics that puts you know all the pieces on a on a on a project level on a on a milestone level in in an execution part. So all four components. They need to be in full play when it comes to digital business transformation. Okay, um, strategic thinking, I mean, that is, it's certainly one thing, but what about getting the job done? Can you apply uh, any of the principles, for example, to implementation? I mean, applying Sun Tzu's principle helps us during, um, during the implementation uh, projects of the digital transformation projects, and you know, I would like to go here in 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 some uh, a little bit more in the detail. So so this is be the green field, brown field, or blue field implementations. So just to to explain it to to the audience here, green field is more or less an implementation approach that starts fresh. You know, starts from scratch. Um, often. Uh, it's able to to use best practice and, and other methodologies. So the focus of Greenfield is really on on innovation and, and, and change. At the end of the day, I want to have um, a digitized business process that is newly designed and of course the business has to change to use it. So Brownfield on the other side, you know, describes more or less a conversion of older IT systems to state-of-the-art uh, digital platform technologies. So, however, usually in, in brownfield situation, you don't have no, not the time and also not the focus to, to do redesign of business processes. You know, so the, um, the focus is really on, 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 a, on a low risk technology upgrade. So, on, in, in terms of tools, I introduce in, in the book also another uh, piece of help, what I call a tactical escalator. This is more or less uh, a, a 10 step approach that needs to be in place if you want to tackle any implementation, be it blue, green, or blue. Um, um, so from that point, it, it would help you to, um, to identify um, the key needs like um, application design, competence centers, root cost analysis, all those things they are needed to to make an implementation um, successful at the end. Great. Um, Andreas, the, the power of partners and partnership has been core to SAP success over the years. Partners, they're the lifeblood of the SAP ecosystem. What part do you think they have to play in digital transformation? 
I mean, they, they need to support um, digital business transformation. So I worked in uh, this past year with uh, GIF. So this is Tom's company. So, so GIF is the product. Uh, Data Migration International is the company. So this, so they provide a data management platform, for example. So they can manage all the historical data, what we talked about earlier, um, and they can do some some uh, data simulations. So they have data simulation capabilities for any uh, target data landscape. So the data migration topic is often um, kind of ignored, I would say, uh, during the strategic uh, stages, but you know, think of Sun Tzu. You know, planning is everything and needs to include everything. So the data topic is a very important one and should not be included. So from that point, uh, on this data level, uh, Chiefs allows, um, and I would say at the push of a button, you have to concentrate all data from all the different uh, legacy systems into one. Uh, into one data store. So there is no decision to make for any business leader about data retention periods, about you know data uh, purging, about you know what there, there's. So it's very straightforward. So you protect, you keep all the history into one data store. So from that point, um, uh, supports any database vendor. But it's very um, uh, it, it it has it has uh, built-in capabilities or the other way. So even S for Hana has built-in capabilities to use the GIFs data platform. So from that point, the data um, the, the 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 partners and uh, you know they can really enrich the SAP ecosystem and make things much much simpler. Great. And I mean, what typical um, digital transformation scenarios do you have in mind when when you're you're talking about uh, with a, a data platform? Yeah, basically, I have uh, from a business perspective three major scenarios. One is uh, system decommissioning. So this means you know during the implementation stage, I do greenfield. So I do something. I implement system so the I want to I want to shut off the old systems with all the all the data so GIFs can really help to move the data into the central data store and then you easily can shut off the system that you know very often it, it, it doesn't does not happen really uh, old systems are really uh, run even after uh, the new system is in place so the second one and this is more often maybe than uh, in these days is mergers and acquisitions. So you combine, you know, different um, companies. Of course, you have also to consolidate IT systems as well. So GIFs moves easily, um, move all the data, the, the O data and the X data and preserve the historical data. And then a very specific um, uh, scenario for SAP customers, for S4HANA customers, what we call right sizing. So this is something uh, where GIFs can help to to keep your actual database, um, your, your in-memory database, for example, uh, from growing and, and, and keep the size at bay. So in summary, in all those three scenarios, they really start Data at the push of a button, and then you only take the data uh, to the target system that you really need. Great. And I guess just before we we, we finish up and maybe go to the the Q and A, uh, there there's some questions that have been posted in the chat. And um, when you summarize the book in a sentence or two, what what would that be? Hmm. I think the the Transformers comes with uh, so so the book Transformers comes with many examples and stories I investigated throughout and with the within the world of data. So for business leaders, uh, the book provides a foundation to understand apply the concepts to their specific situations, enables them 
to guide their digital business trans transformation projects in a much better way. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks very much, Andreas. Tom, um, any any thoughts or questions in the chat? Uh, yes, uh, Liam. In fact, yes, and Andreas. We got uh, actually two questions. I had much easier, but uh, uh, they have some meat on it here. The first question comes from Luis Gol uh, Golmenares in the uh, in the question section. Um, it says, "Hello, Andreas. It's good to see you as well as Liam." I meet uh, uh, with you, uh, with him in Ireland during the CCC Info Forum. My question is about what are the secret ing ingredients of the book on a methodology to build a good digital transformation strategy? All right. I guess, Luis, you thanks for your you question. Only two, uh, maximum two minutes. Uh. <laughs> two minutes, yeah. So first of all, um, you need to read the book. <laughs> then you get all the, the, the ingredients, of course. Um, but in a nutshell, I think um, when, I, when I think back, I mean, the main ingredient is the strategic thought leadership. So you need to, if you want to build something, you need to know the end game. You know, so take take a blank sheet of paper. You know, draw uh, your end game, and then you easily define the, the way from today to 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 your vision. But you know, v visualize your vision in on a whiteboard or on on piece of paper. Make All sense. Right. Totally. <laughs> and if you read the book, you see even more. Uh, the second question comes from Anthony Profeta. Andreas, you mentioned Hustle's 2006 contributions to the database as the breakthrough in data storage. Can you expand on the how this might have impacted the X experience? I mean, uh, Hustle invented the in-memory database. so. Uh, or the HANA database, so he did not invent column-based um, uh, the database architecture, so he used it, you know, but he, at the, at the end of the day, he really focusing on, you know, getting faster, um, uh, uh, faster uh, queries out of the database. So, so he achieved it focusing on the OData. So over time, you know, when particular, I mean, it's already passed already, but when, when SAP, you know, went into the experience data stage, I mean, the, the thought I had at that point, um, you know, they want to integrate. So they are using the, cable, the, the technology, so the in-memory database, they're using the technology, but, you know, focusing on complete different sets of data. What is, in this case, it's unstructured data. You know, so at the end of the day, Hana is also able to to work on on this unstructured data thing. You know where uh, all the experience data sit. So, so from that point, I think uh, while Hasso did not have in mind at that point when he when he started his prototype in 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 Berlin um, in 2006 uh, that he wanted to focus on experience data. Um, you know, in the meantime. You know, technology and also the business needs, they expanded into the, the space of, of experience data as well. So from that point, I think it's, it's uh, very, uh, very encouraging to see um, that, um, you know, HANA is not staying uh, as a block forever, but they are moving and innovating and uh, changing as they should. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, uh, Andreas. I have one question that's uh, my personal question, but I heard it from uh, many people, and that's for you, Liam. Um, as we know, SAP has done over the uh, last, let's say, uh, uh, 10 years, maybe even more than that, a little bit, starting with, uh, uh, with uh, business objects and so on, uh, a lot of acquisitions. And uh, the question is, what is the strategy uh, what is SAP strategy to integrate all those acquisitions over the last years uh, in order to deliver at the end of the day more value? I mean, you mentioned also the partners that come into place. Uh, what is 
uh, but concretely, what is the really the what is SAP doing to integrate them into the core to bring more value to the table? Thanks, Tom. Uh, a nice, easy question to uh, uh, to end the, the end the evening on or, or started in. Uh, in in uh, in Philadelphia, and um, I, I mean, there's no doubt about it, a strong business process integration across the entire value chain and and harmonised data model um, to provide a 360 degree view of the business using real time for for SAP and non SAP data is, is vital. I mean, we've also over time embedded Analytics Cloud, for example, directly into uh, SAP S4 HANA Cloud. Um, emerging processes and analytics and, and this year we will continue to deepen the integration of our cloud solutions you know with the focus on field glass c for hana a digital supply chain and um, we have recently launched an inter uh, an integration strategy paper uh, that's now um, available and that document provides a comprehensive overview of our integrate integration plan in the cloud i mean our business technology platform including the cloud platform the sap cloud platform integration suite uh, provides all the capabilities for process data, user, uh, and analytic-centric integrations as well, enabling, uh, for example, out-of-box integration for SAP to SAP scenarios. Um, harmonized data models uh, and a central master data service will simplify as well uh, the sharing and distribution of master data across the intelligence suite. Um, we've also recently provided an update to SAP's integration roadmap uh, in the cloud and um, including uh, updated timelines for our key processes for the intelligent enterprise. So recruit to retire, lead to cash, design to operate, and, and source to pay. And um, our integration suite is, uh, offering is also, it's completed by the um, SAP integration solution advisory methodology that, that um, will help customers to define and execute their integration strategy. So there is a huge amount of focus happening on integration. And um, yeah, there's, uh, please keep an eye. I mean, all the information is on sap.com uh, for both customers and partners there as well. But it is, I would say, one of the key focuses for SAP over the coming months. Thank you very much, Liam. I think uh, that's good news for the SAP customer base. We have many of them actually attending the, the webinar. So it's, uh, it's good news. And uh, last questions before we end. Uh, yeah, Andreas, so what's next? I mean, uh, you had your uh, long journey with SAP around the world. You did all these uh, hundreds of implementations and have all that experience. And uh, in your first uh, book, you shared the pitfalls. And now you go more into a business uh, uh, setting, you know, what really business leaders need to take, you know, from design thinking all the way they need to understand technology. They under, uh, it's not just that they can delegate it. It's, as the Germans would say, it's chef sache. It's, um, it's a management task. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what's next? I mean, are you cycling, or have you become a master in uh, organ playing, or, or what, what's next? Maybe all. No, I mean, I always, you know, when I say, you know, the business leaders they need to have a vision. You know, I mean, I. I put myself in, you know, this is my own shoes, so to so to speak. You know, so what what I experienced the last few weeks or so, I have um, still many so many questions, particular uh, around the topic of digital marketing. So you know, how how can I reach? How can I use the existing tools? Not just paying Google Ads and hope for the best, but so that I understand it. So at the moment, I don't understand it. So, so from yet to it full. So I could not do a, 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 a talk on, on this subject today. But you know, this is a topic that really drives me. And this is potentially a topic I will write my next book. So I will have investigate first. And then I will give a little bit more, let's say, um, basic information, basic, in, uh, you know, uh, Good, good information for, in particular, small and medium-sized business leaders. I mean, the big ones, they can, you know, like Liam, you know, he has so many data scientists at his hands. I mean, he can easily do whatever he wants. But the small ones, you know, they are the, the one to five or 10 uh, people companies or even the hundred ones, they don't have uh, departments, but they want to get out as well, you know, they want to get on the digital channels. They want to reach customers. They want to be recognized. They want to be seen. So this is a topic that uh, drives me, and this might be the theme of my next book. 
Outstanding. That's uh, marketing, as you know, is my passion. And uh, <laughs> I think so. that many companies, especially after <clears throat> COVID, you know, they are trying to stay alive and uh, uh, that can make the difference to reach the customer. And uh, you can, uh, you need strategies for that. So here yeah. is, uh, you see on the slide here uh, where you can get the book. I highly recommend to you guys to, uh, to look at it. You can have a uh, a digital version or you can have a, a real uh, 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 physical uh, uh, version it's a beautiful book you know makes it good on every coffee table when you have guests so uh, congratulations Andreas once okay. again and thank you Liam for all the time and uh, insight uh, to SAP and uh, thank you very much from the bottom of my heart yeah thanks, thanks both to you so Liam Tom thanks so much more than welcome bye now Okay. okay. Bye, bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, Thank bye, you. everybody. Bye, bye.